Um, I thought I'd just jump into the reading tonight. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the article today in the Post, so many of you know my whole story already. <laughs> um, I thought that was a really sensitive piece. I was really happy with it. It's been hard, um, as you can imagine, maybe being out here and telling such a personal story and hoping that people can receive it with the um, uh, openness with which I gave it and hoping that people can um, uh, open their hearts to the emotional qualities of this story as opposed to um, being over critical or over analytical or um, uh, wanting a more cool, distant, clever narrative which seems to be so hip and prevalent in our culture these days. This is a very um, raw, emotional, watery narrative. Um, so it was really great to see that uh, that uh, person who wrote that was really, I thought, generous, as generous with me as I felt I've tried to be with this book. Um, so... When they meet in 1965 in Jackson, Mississippi, my parents are idealists. They are social activists. They are movement folk. They believe in ideas, leaders, and the power of organized people working for change. They believe in justice and equality and freedom. My father is a liberal Jew who believes these abstractions can be realized through the swift, clean application of the law. My mother believes they can be cultivated through the telling of stories, through the magic ability of words to redefine and create subjectivity. She herself is newly black. She and my father comprise an interracial couple. By the time they fall in love, my parents do not believe in the uber sanctity of family. They do not believe that blood must necessarily be thicker than water because water is what they are to each other and they will be together despite the objection of blood. In 1967, when my parents break all the rules and marry against laws that say they can't, they say that an individual should not be bound to the wishes of their family, race, state, or country. They say that love is the tie that binds, and not blood. In a photograph from their wedding day, they stand brown and pale pink, inseparable. My mother's tiny five-foot-one-inch frame nestled bird-like within my father's protective embrace. Fearless, naive, breathtaking, they profess their shiny, outlaw love for all the world to see. I am not a bastard, the product of a rape, the child of some white devil. I am a movement child. My parents tell me I can do anything I put my mind to, that I can be anything I want. They buy me erector sets and building blocks, tinker toys and books, more and more books. The Berenstein Bears, Dr. Seuss, Hans Christian Andersen. We are middle class. My mother puts a colorful patterned scarf on her head and throws parties for me in our backyard under the carport and beside the creek. She invites all of my friends over and watches over us as we roast hot dogs. She makes Kool-Aid and laughs when one of us kids does something cute or funny. I am not tragic. So the book um, starts off with my birth in Jackson in 1969 and then uh, goes all the way through high school going back and forth from a contemporary like today voice back to those memories. Um, and um, basically what happened is my parents divorced when I was eight years old and then my mother moved across the country and so I spent most of my life as a young person shuttling back and forth between my father's um, uh, more sort of upper middle class, predominantly Jewish, suburban, Westchester, New York kind of home, and my mother's more um, African American, artistic, bohemian, um, more middle class, working class, San Francisco community. Um, and. And then even in between those two, I spent time, uh, for a year I lived in 
the Bronx, which was different still from those two in that almost everyone at my school was Puerto Rican or Dominican, and I looked more Puerto Rican, so for the year I just decided I was Puerto Rican, and like that was it. I was like, okay, I'm Puerto Rican, and you know, and I got my Puerto Rican thing happening, and... Um, <laughs> And so the book is really, um, the first, the title that I worked with for a long time was, was Morphology, Morphology, Memoir of a Shifting Self, um, because it's not just about black, white, and Jewish, it's not just about race and religion, it's about um, being a child of divorce, it's about being a child who has moved from different worlds and through different worlds, the way almost all of us have, and the way we continue to have to, um, and it's about um, piecing together uh, aspects of ourselves that seem so disparate um, and it's about um, trying to understand the ways in which race and culture are performative that we act out um, what we think we're supposed to be as a black person as a Jewish person and and that those things don't define all of who we are and that there is so much more behind the mask um, of culture and identity um, so the book jumps around between times and places, and many of the chapters start uh, with a chapter heading of the city. Um, so this is from Brooklyn, and this is after Jackson, Mississippi, which is a little bit of what I just read. Um, and this is after my parents' divorce. Okay, so... I don't know. And I also try to tell each of these stories in the voice of the child that I was. So there are different ages that you can hopefully pick up on uh, at different places. I don't know. Mama put me in this new school over here near where we live now. She and me in three rooms the size of one of the floors of our old house, mine and Mama and Daddy's house. We went to the little office on the first floor with Mama's new boyfriend, and she filled out the papers, and the people looked me up and down and shuffled some other papers, and then Mama said I needed to be in the gifted class, and the woman behind the desk looked at me again, harder, like she was trying to see through to my brain. And then I was in a classroom with Mrs. Leone helping her staple orange leaves made out of construction paper to the wall around the blackboard. And then I was walking down the hallway with my new class, following the green line painted on the waxy concrete floor. And then we were in the auditorium for assembly, and then I was in Mr. Ward's music class, just like that. It is dark in Mr. Ward's music room. There is wood on the walls, which is weird because our school, PS321, is made of cement and other hard materials like metal, which is in skinny bars on the windows. Mama's new boyfriend says this is because our school was built in the 50s when they thought you could prepare for an A-bomb. Mr. Ward is handing out instruments from a big cardboard box next to his piano bench. He tries to distribute them evenly throughout the room, so it's not just the kids in front who get the good instruments, but there are way more of us than there are cymbals and drums and guitars, so most of us get plastic yellow recorders with one part missing. I feel out of my element here in Mr. Ward's class, like everyone knows how to make music but me, even though I can tell by the way the other kids are banging and blowing that this is not true. It is true that I am much more comfortable in reading class, where I whiz through the SRA colors like a bat out of hell. I'm in the third grade, but according to the purple and red folders I am up to in SRA, I read at the seventh grade level. I get 100s on all of my spelling tests, and Mrs. Leone puts them up on the closet doors next to the SRA folders at the back of the room. Sometimes when I am in her class, I feel like it's just me and her in the room and none of the other kids is there at all. It's sort of like that in Mr. Ward's class, too, except I don't feel like I'm here with Mr. Ward. Here I'm just alone with all these other kids with names and faces, but not much else. When Mr. Ward tells me to, I put my fingertips on a couple of the holes and blow through the mouthpiece of my recorder. I try to focus on what Mr. Ward is saying, but he seems bored and aggravated, especially by the boys in the back who won't be quiet and do what he says. When everyone starts playing their instruments and making an awful, loud, horrible noise that hurts my ears, Mr. Ward just spaces out and looks at us like he doesn't know how we all got to be here together in the basement of some public school in Brooklyn. Brian Caton is sitting with his legs crossed on my left, 
closer to the music stands by the door, beating on a drum. If I close my eyes, I can almost smell him. Brian has milky white skin and red freckles. He has sandy brown hair that always falls in front of his eyes like Linus on Charlie Brown. Brian lives way out in Bay Ridge somewhere, but his parents own the dry cleaning store across the street from school, the one next to the pizza parlor where we all go for lunch. If I walk to school early enough, I sometimes see Brian getting out of a black car with his parents. He crosses the street and goes into school while his father rolls up the gate in front of the cleaners. Brian Caton is the boy I like. I don't know why I like him, I just do. I like the way he is kind of tough and has a lot of friends and talks in a choppy offhand way like he doesn't care if anyone is listening. I like the way his parents give him money when he asks for it. I like it that his mother and father are right across the street. The one time I go into Kate and Cleaners with Brian at lunchtime, it is all warm inside, and his mother smiles when we come in and asks him why he is late, like she was worried. For a split second, I imagine myself back behind the counter with her, getting lost in all of the hanging skirts and blouses and suits, breathing in all those fumes and pressing my cheeks against the silky plastic bags. I imagine that she tells me to stop, that I could hurt myself, in that same worried voice. I tell Sarah that Brian Caton is the boy I like. Sarah is my friend, but I don't trust her all the way. This year I'm paranoid. I don't trust any of my friends all the way. Not Donna, not Siobhan, not Jamie, who I sometimes meet on the corner in the morning so we can walk to school together. I trust Karen, but she lives by my old house, and now she goes to a private school six blocks away, and I never see her. I'm never sure what the new friends are going to do, if they're going to stop being my friends one day for no good reason, or what. So Sarah tells Brian, and then Brian tells me in front of his friends after school one day, when it is cold and there is dirty gray snow on the ground, and we are all leaving to go home, that he doesn't like black girls. Brian Caton tells me that he doesn't like black girls. Brian Caton, the boy that I like, tells me that he doesn't like black girls. And I think with this big whoosh that turns my stomach upside down and almost knocks me over, is that what I am? A black girl? And that's when all the trouble starts because suddenly I don't know what I am and I don't know how to be not what he thinks I am. I don't know how to be a not black girl. My stepmother is a not black girl. When she picks me up on Fridays after school in her tall brown suede boots for the weekend, I wait inside school a little longer until I'm sure Brian is outside and will see me go over to her and be hugged by her. I want him to see her take my backpack from me and take my hand. And I want him to see me get into her car. And when my grandma Miriam comes to pick me up on other days, I do the same thing. I make a big fuss in front of school so that he will see that I am related to not black girls. I start to brush my hair straight a hundred times every night before I go to bed, like I see Jan Brady do on the Brady Bunch. <laughs> Jan Brady is a not black girl. I roll my hair in pink rollers when I'm at my grandma's house so that I will have bangs, so that my hair will look more like the not black girls in my class. And I tell my stepmother that I want the doll that she says I should want, because all girls want dolls. And even though I have not ever had a baby doll, and I'm not at all interested in a plastic baby that eats colored mush and then poops it back out, I think this must be part of being a not black girl. At school, Mrs. Leone tells us that we, our class, are going to put on a play for the whole school. She tells us this from the front of the classroom where she walks back and forth looking out at our faces. Some of you will make the sets for the show, she says. Some of you will make costumes. And some of you, she says, looking at me, will act. The play is The Wizard of Oz and she hands out short rectangular stacks of paper to the first person in each row to pass backward until we all have our own wad of mimeographed sheets to hold. I rush through my pages, inhaling the sweet, tart, medicine-y odor of the purplish blue ink. Who do I want to be? We read the whole play out loud, and everyone who wants to act tries different parts on to see which one fits. 
Mrs. Leone has me try the lion, Auntie M, the wizard himself. I do not notice that she only has not black girls read the words underneath Dorothy's name. I am too excited by the idea of acting, of reading out loud and making my voice change to match what I think each character should sound like. By the end of class time, it is all decided. I will play the Wicked Witch of the West. I don't tell my mother too much about the play, and she doesn't ask. It isn't a big deal, I say, hoping she won't see through my mask of nonchalance. I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to lie either, but how else am I going to convince her not to come to see me on play night? How else can I explain that Brian Caton doesn't like black girls, and if she comes, he will definitely know that I am, in fact, a black girl, and all of my other efforts to be a not black girl will be washed away? How else can I stay with my mother and still leave? On the night of the play, as I am trying on my black witch's cape and pointy hat for the umpteenth time, I beg her not to come. I will be too nervous, I say. I won't be able to remember my lines if you are there, I say. Please, Mama, don't come. She looks at me strangely, like the woman in the office did, trying to see through to my brain. I hold my breath, but she doesn't push. She doesn't... Um, she takes me at my word, and I go free, alone, out into the night. When I look out from the stage, I can make out my grandmother's white face in the dark crowd. I think, Mama is not here. Mama is at home. I think, surely Brian will see my grandmother. I think, surely Brian will like me now. At the end, when all the parents and teachers stand up and clap for us, I feel an unexpected sadness come into my body, a heat inching up from someplace underneath the skin on my face. I picture Mama lying in her big bed by the window alone, the lamp giving off a pool of yellow light as she reads, silently wondering about play night. Even though everyone says I was good, my Mama, the one with the most important voice, can never say this to me. Shame sticks to me like sweat. After their divorce is final, sorry, I've made you all now move and come back. After their divorce is final and they sell the house we all three lived in, and after my father takes a government civil rights job in Washington, D.C., and my mother moves to San Francisco where she feels she can write better because she can see the sky, my parents decide that I will spend two years alternately with each of them. I don't know how they come up with that number, two, as opposed to one, or why they didn't simply put me in junior high here and high school there. I don't know if staying in one city so that I wouldn't have to spend my life zigzagging the country so that I could have some semblance of a normal relationship with friends and family members ever crossed either of my parents' minds. What their decision means is that every year of my life I have to move, change schools, shift. My father returns to the life that was expected of him, marrying a nice Jewish girl he met as a kid in summer camp. And my mother falls for a Morehouse man, an old sweetheart from her Spellman days. For them, there is a return to what is familiar, safe, and expected. For me, there is a turning away from all of those things. Now, as I move from place to place, from Jewish to black, from DC to San Francisco, from status quo middle class to radical artist Bohemia, it is less like jumping from station to station on the same radio dial, and more like moving from planet to planet between universes that never overlap. I move through days, weeks, people, places, growing attached and then letting go, meeting people and then saying goodbye. Holding on makes it harder to be adaptable, harder to meet the demands of a new place. It is easier to forget, to wipe the slate clean, to watch the world go by like a film on a screen without letting anything stick. So this is a section from uh, San Francisco. So that was Brooklyn, now we're in San Francisco.
little person getting restless. <laughs> Lisa Green in Mrs. Thompson's math class, six seats behind me, staring bored out the window. Lisa Green walking in the schoolyard, she on one side of the squares of the metal fence, glaring at me on the other. Lisa Green strutting down the hallway, a chain with her keys on one end dangling from low-slung, perfectly creased burgundy chinos. Lisa Green on the bus, the 44, sitting in the back, knee up, foot resting on the hump above the wheel. The only thing girl about her, the two lemon-yellow barrettes closed around her thick, mixed-race hair. But then on other days, she's all curves, full breasts buttoned into a Mandarin-style top, hair up in a bun, tight black skirt, pointy red shoes bought or maybe stolen from Emporium Capwell, the big department store on Market Street, Lisa as cocktail waitress at Szechuan Delight, Lisa as prostitute from a movie on Vietnam. Lisa and me lying in the back room of her house at 3 a.m. in our underwear, we're lying head to foot, smoking Newports and blowing smoke rings. There's a little portable radio next to us on the bare, dirty, blue-striped mattress, playing Happy Anniversary. A brother singing, and I remember, I remember when we used to play Shoot 'Em Up. It's KSOL's late night show, and whenever we're at Lisa's house, we listen to it. To the DJ with the low, smooth voice, playing old love songs from back in the day. Songs that Danita remembers when they come on the radio while we're in her car. The Burgundy Cutlass Supreme. Songs that make her shake her head and say, damn, I remember when that came out. I was in high school dating such and such a boy. It's dusty and dirty back here in this room because Lisa's mother never comes back here. And the only time it gets any use is when Lisa or her sister brings friends to do stuff they can't do out in the open, like smoke weed and drink wine coolers out of brown paper bags. Back here, there isn't even a TV, like the one that's always on in the front room, where Lisa's tiny, light-skinned mother sits watching her stories, as the world turns, one life to live, and all my children. And where we sit, me, Lisa, her mother, and her sister Lori, some Saturday mornings watching Soul Train with Don Cornelius and American Bandstand with Dick Clark. Back here, there is only the radio playing love songs and a blue bulb Lisa stole from Lucky's screwed into an old lamp base. When we're back here, Lisa and I talk about people. The skinny black girl with the nasty scar down her face. That red-headed boy who comes to school late. Not like 20 minutes late, but like after lunch late. The cute Mexican boy with the shiny black hair, Chris, who has a crush on me. Susan, Lisa's best friend who used to threaten to beat me up way back before Lisa and me became friends and Lisa put a stop to all that. We don't talk about Lisa and her mother and sister being poor. We don't talk about how they all three sleep on one lumpy mattress. How when Lisa's mother sends us to the store for eggs and milk, she gives us food stamps. How the only heat in the house comes from the oven. No. I tell her about Michael and what cologne he wears, one man show, and all the gory details of what we do when we fool around. She asks me if I like to suck it. I don't know what she means at first, but then I'm lying to keep up. Yeah, yeah, I like to do that, I say, but it's too big. Lisa cracks up. Too big? Girl, don't you know it ain't ever too big? Lisa is short, much shorter than me, but in her family, she is the tallest and the darkest. Her mother's head reaches maybe to my breastbone, and with Lori, it's the same way. Even though it's clear that they do, I don't think to myself that Lisa and Lori must have different fathers. I guess because we don't ever talk about fathers. Neither of us has one that's anywhere around at the moment, and in her house, the whole idea seems like a moot point. Lisa's is a family of women. No man ever comes home and the only time men are mentioned is when Lisa's mother says something in Spanish about all the boys calling Lisa on the phone and how Lisa better be careful with all those boys. She don't want no bebe. Lisa has lots of boys after her because she's cute and fast. She has a big butt and big breasts and a pretty smile. All of her boyfriends are way older. They're in high school or working already. 
Tonight, Lisa's talking about Joe, Marvin's brother, and how she's through with him. Lisa says she's leaving Joe because he's stingy. He doesn't give her enough. I nod and say, yeah, you better cut him loose. Mm -hmm. But I'm not really sure what Joe's not giving her. Money, sex, attention. Lisa doesn't need any more clothes. She's got a whole closet full of red and fuchsia and yellow outfits from Emporium and Pennies and Miller's Outpost. Stuff she steals on weekend trips to Saramonte. Lisa's really good at stealing. She walks around the store picking skirts and blouses off the racks, holding things up to her body in front of mirrors like she's gonna buy them. The security guards don't pay her any mind because she calls attention to herself, asking me all loud in front of them if I think whatever she's looking at is cute or will it match the striped jacket she has at home. When they turn around, she stuffs it into her bag or up under her shirt, then tells me to come on and follow her out the door. After happy anniversary goes off, and then when we get married does too, Lisa asks me if I see myself getting married, and to who, and how do I want to live. For a second I'm surprised, taken aback. I haven't been in my own mind thinking thoughts about boyfriends or what I want to be when I grow up. I've been watching Lisa's full lips blow smoke rings, the way she holds the cigarette, not between her fore and middle fingers like, a guy, like girls are supposed to, but between her forefinger and her thumb, like a guy. I've been watching her eyes move beneath the lids, noticing how naked they seem without the heavy black eyeliner she usually wears. Luckily, Lisa breaks back in before I can answer. She says she wants a big house and cars and a man who has bank. When she says bank, she slaps one hand top down onto the mattress for emphasis. He gotta have bank. It's cold, and so I push my legs a little closer to Lisa's torso, feeling for the warmth there. I think of Dynasty, the show we watch on Wednesday nights, with Crystal, Alexis, Blake, and Bobby Joe. I think of the opening credits when they're flying over the big houses and swimming pools, the circular driveways full of fancy cars, and then the writing in cursive, like on the cover of the Harlequin books Lisa reads, Dynasty. I can't imagine being married and I tell her so. My mom is not married and she says it's better that way. To have people come to visit you when you want to see them, but that to live together all the time is crazy, unhealthy. <laughs> I guess that sounds right to me and I tell Lisa that. It would be okay if I was alone with my man coming to see me when I wanted him to, I say, not married. As for bank, well, I don't know. Lisa says, girl, you crazy, and I shrug, pull back a little and take a drag of my Newport. The menthol in the smoke hits my lungs like a little stab, but I don't put it out. The truth is I don't really think that far ahead. Lying next to Lisa on the dirty mattress in the cold room is enough for me. It fills all of my senses, and I don't think about hardly anything else. <clears throat> Maybe somewhere in the back of my mind I'm thinking about what my mother would say if she saw me. I'm wondering if she could imagine what Lisa's house is like and what we do back here in this little room. It's not like a whole conscious thought or anything, but somewhere I feel like maybe I want my mother to find out that where I am may not be very safe, and I want her to tell me to come home. I want her to tell me that I can't go so far away from her while I'm so young. I can't get on the 44 late at night and ride to the other side of San Francisco to spend the night with people she doesn't know, with people she's never seen. But that's just a feeling I have, some picture in my mind that has no words, that's buried beneath un everything else, under new ports, and being like Lisa. I don't want to think about that, so I just let my eyes close when they want to, lift the cigarette to my mouth every few minutes, and let my body vibrate from the sounds on the radio. Even though I have different feelings underneath, it still mostly feels like I love it back here, the way it feels like we're in our own spaceship, gliding through a quiet, sleepy universe. The way I feel so close to Lisa and not alone. The way her toughness, how she always seems to know what she wants, makes it easier for me to lope along at her side, pretending to move in ways that come natural to her, to Lisa Green, a half Spanish girl living with her mother and sister in a tiny rundown house in Hunter's Point, but not to me.
How you doing? Should I read just one more little section? Yeah? And then we'll do some questions. When I am in college, I travel with my mother and also alone to Greece, England, Ireland, Spain, France, Holland. In Spain, people tell me I must be a dirty Mexican because I don't speak Spanish with the lisp left over from a stuttering king. And in France, I am treated like the Algerian I am presumed on many occasions to be. Waiters ignore me. Hotel concierges forget my cleaning or otherwise botch my requests. And cab drivers pass me and my friends on the street without so much as a glance. In England, when I go there with my boyfriend to visit his relatives in Cornwall, my race is completely unspoken, a subject which is obviously on people's minds, but is utterly taboo, as if it represents something beyond words, beyond comprehension. As if not speaking about race, except to spit tersely whenever it does come up, that it doesn't matter at all, is proof that the British are tolerant, progressive, accepting. But when I am in high school and my mother starts to make more money, we travel to Jamaica, Mexico, Bali. We go as tourists, but because my mother is an artist and makes an effort to meet other artists everywhere we go, and because we are people of color who take the time to learn as much as we can about the culture we are visiting, and because we treat the people we meet as if they are human beings and not objects there solely to respond to our every whim, we are embraced by people, taken in like family. In these places where many of the people have skin the same color as mine, and where I am not embroiled in the indigenous racial politics of the day, I get a glimpse of a kind of freedom I have not experienced at home, where I always seem to be waiting for a bomb to drop, and where I feel I am always being reminded of the significance, for better or worse, of my racial inheritance. In the race-obsessed United States, my color defines me, tells a story I have not written. In countries of color, I feel that I am defined by my interactions with people, how open I am, how willing to truly see and be seen by another. What skills do I bring? How able am I to communicate, even when we speak a different language? My lover asks me one night late, when we are all bundled up and close under our comforter, and our child has long since gone to be with his grandparents for the summer, what it feels like to have white inside of me. What does it feel like to have white inside of you, she asks, and I can hear the burning curiosity in her voice. Physically, you mean? Yeah, physically. Are you aware that there is white in you? And does that whiteness feel different from blackness? What is it like to have thin curly hair and lighter skin? What does it feel like? Her question throws me, but only for a few seconds. My first response is, what is whiteness? And how can one feel white when race is just about the biggest cultural construct there is? She nods, but she's heard me deconstruct it a million times. Yeah, 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 but if you're operating within it, come on, let yourself go. Do you ever feel anything different? <laughs> well, I say, the only time I feel white is when black folks point out something in me that they don't want to own in themselves and so label as white. My tendency to psychoanalyze, for example, or my greater tolerance for cold. <laughs> My hard-earned sense of entitlement is another example, or my insistence on physical beauty wherever I live, which ironically comes from the black side of my family tree. I also feel white when I compare myself physically to darker people and find myself lacking. I most experience whiteness then as a lack of some attribute or another a lack of a certain kind of thickness, of a particular full, round, womanly shape that I find beautiful and associate with abundance. A lack of color, of the richness, depth, and luminosity that I see in skin darker than my own. 
a lack of a non-neurotic quality, a kind of freedom from obsessive mental anguish, which I admit I definitely lack, <laughs> thanks to the Jewish folks in my life. <laughs> I don't exactly think to myself, oh, I feel white at those particular moments, but I do carry a constant sense of not black in those areas, of deprivation in those areas, of wanting to have more of something than what I have. But is whiteness something I can feel on or in my body like a stomach ache or a burn? No. I ask her if she feels black. Yes, is her instant reply. And because her mother was so color conscious, all her life associating goodness with lighter skinned black people and evil with those darker, and because she went to one of the most color stratified black colleges in the country, and because dark skin is generally reviled in a culture that deifies whiteness, she says she does feel an instant kinship with those who are darker, who share her brownness, who have been raised with the same shit hurled at them, the same messages to have to rewrite. She feels black, yes, all of the time. She says on the tail end of all that, so like when someone black starts talking about my people have been oppressed for so long, do you identify with those people? Do you feel that bond in your gut? Can you throw your fist up behind that? Do you think of black people as your people? I sense we are headed into a danger zone. <laughs> Is this a test? I breathe. I do and I don't, I say. I have never been granted the luxury of being claimed unequivocally by any people or race. And so when someone starts talking about my people, I know that if we look hard enough or scratch at the surface long enough, they would have some problem with some part of my background, the part that's not included in this particular my people construction. It's not that I am not loved and accepted by friends and family. It is just that there is always that little thing that sets me slightly apart, the cracker lurking in my laugh. And then there's the question of how I can feel fully identified with my people, quote unquote, when I have other people too, who are not included in that grouping. And this feeling I have of having other people too is in effect even when the other people under consideration do not claim me. Does that make sense, I ask? She nods. What I do feel is an instant affinity with beings who suffer, whether they are my own, whatever that means, or not. Do I identify with the legacy of slavery and discrimination in this country? Yes. Do I identify with the legacy of anti-Jewish sentiment and exclusion? Yes. Do I identify with the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II? Yes. Do I identify with the struggle against brutality and genocide waged against the Native Americans in this country? Yes. Do I feel I have to choose one of these allegiances in order to know who I am or in order to pay proper respect to my ancestors? No. Do I hope that what my ancestors love in me is my ability to muster compassion for those who suffer, including myself? Yes. It seems to me that this too is how memory works. What we remember of what was done to us shapes our view, molds us, sets our stance. But what we remember is past. It no longer exists. And yet still we hold on to it, live by it, surrender so much control to it. What do we become when we put down the scripts written by history and memory? when each person before us can be seen free of the cultural or personal narrative we've inherited or devised, when we ourselves can taste that freedom. I'm going to start reading now.